glad you got to be in church today. Amen. 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 I'm, I'm like David. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I look forward to this every week, and I hope y'all do too, just simply because of reasons like this. And I know that God got something in store for us today. And how many are just excited for what God's already doing? Amen. Amen. And what he's about to do. I have got about a three-hour sermon I need to preach in about 20 minutes. And the more you amen me, the more you help me, the quicker it's going to go. So if you will help me today, we'll get out of here a lot quicker. If not, uh, the Baptist will beat you to Camp 31's buffet. So help me out, and I'll help you out. Amen? If you will get your, your sword, however it's by a cell phone or a physical one, let's go to Daniel chapter 3. And today, there's so many directions this may go, and God help me. Um, but today, I want to talk about what do you do when the heat is turned up? What do you do? How do you live when the heat is turned up? Can we pray one more time before we go into the Word? And I, we always do this. Let's put one hand on our heart. And stretch one hand this way, please, and ask the Lord to use me as a vessel to bring forth the word. Father, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you, Lord, for the calling, and I thank you, Lord, for this vocation that you have called me to, to minister the word to this flock. And God, I pray that today, that, Lord, that you will anoint me as your vessel, anoint me as the shepherd, Father, anoint me as the messenger and the minister today, and, Lord, make this easy to preach. God, let me recall to my memory what needs to be recalled, Lord, and help me to stay on track, and, God, just help me, and, God, I pray that as I preach that, God, the people in this congregation will have ears to hear and hearts to receive what thus says the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Everything this morning could not have worked out as perfectly as it did without the Lord doing it because I had no idea Misty had planned to do what she did without the notebook and the Bible. So, But all that really helped me segue into what I want to talk about today simply because when I was about 15, 16, called to the ministry, I had prayed the same prayer because I, had, I liked to read, but the Word was always so difficult. I was raised in a King James only sort of, you know, way with my grandmother, and that was hard for me with the begots and the bounds and the bees and the this, and I, I just got so confused and it just bored me, to be honest with you. But as I got into the Word, especially the Old Testament, the Old Testament is my favorite portion of the Bible to read, and simply because whether you realize it or not, the Bible all the way through, but especially the Old Testament. There are so many events, so many stories, so many occurrences in there that they speak to a lot of what we go through today. Now, if you read them at face value, a lot of times you'll probably miss it. But if you get into that study and you start looking at certain stories and you start reading <coughs> commentaries or books or whatever, you will start to discover that there's so much in the Old Testament. And that's why a lot of the sermons I preach come out of the Old Testament. Because there's so many stories, there's so much in there, Aunt Brenda, that you can extract from. And I've heard it said before that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And so everything in there, whether it's a prophecy or whether it's just speaking to a life occurrence, everything from Genesis to Revelation, all of it speaks to certain situations in life. And the literary term a lot of people use for that in the Old Testament is prophetic parallels. And basically that means that there's things in the story, symbols, types, shadows, things that speak to future events, whether prophetically or whether just regular day life. For example, in Exodus, when they put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and the death angel passed, that was a symbol. That was a parallel to what would happen in the Gospels when Jesus gave up his life on Passover. Because he was the Passover lamb that when the door, the blood is applied to the doorpost of our heart, the death angel has to pass. Uh, that's a whole other sermon in itself, but that's an example. And there's so many stories that we can go to, but one of my favorite stories when I start to think about speaking to life and its issues is here in Daniel chapter 3. 
And you're all familiar with this story. You could probably recite it to me if I were to ask you to, at least in your own way, maybe not verbatim. And in this story, we're released, we are introduced to three men that we all know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, and in this story, you know, you know how they have been brought into Babylonian captivity with Daniel, and they have been chosen by the uh, Babylonian king to be part of the royal court. Nebuchadnezzar had chosen these four men because the Bible says that they were they were skilled in wisdom, they were skilled in understanding, and it said also because they were good looking. I like to think I would have been in that class. Maybe, maybe. Um, Misty Lamb. I get the rest of you to leave it, Misty Jones. So, anyway. But they said that he chose them because they were skilled and they were good looking and uh, he chose these men and trained them. And they were part of the royal court of Babylon. And this was really a, it was really an honor because they were slaves. They were captives in the land. And so to be part of the royal court was something, especially since you're a slave. But when you read the story, not just of Daniel, but of these three men, you will discover that while they were in an honorable position, they were kind of controversial. And the reason was is because they, though they were part of this culture, and though Nebuchadnezzar had tried to make them kind of form to his ideology and his way of thinking and train them and what he wanted them to do, while they were a part of this culture, they were what the Bible, the New Testament would say, in the world but not of the world. Because while they were in this culture and they were in this, this royal court and they had all these expectations of them, there were things they refused to do, Evelyn, because they said that's not what our God would have us to do. And that made them very controversial, a lot like today. I'm not careful, I'll get ahead of myself. And we see this from the very word go, because not long after they're chosen, in chapter 1, the Bible says that the servants brought to them the meat from the king's table and the wine, and that Daniel and the three men refused to eat. And scholars will tell you that because most of the meat that was at the king's table would have been offered to idols, and that was a no-no in Jewish culture. You did not eat meat sacrificed to idols, and they said, we won't eat it. And that was an offensive decision, Brother Eddie. That, that was a, an offense to the king. That could have caused him to die because that was, that was his way of showing them hospitality. For them not to receive what he made for them was basically a slap in the face. But Daniel, and, and how skilled he was, made a deal with him, and you know the story. Give us ten days, we'll eat what we want to eat. You eat what you want to eat, let's see who's better. And after ten days, the Bible says that they were fuller, their faces were fatter, and they were, uh, they were actually more, they looked healthier than the king's men who had eaten meat from the king's table. And that's just the first example. But here in chapter 3, this is probably the biggest example, and all of us know the story. And Nebuchadnezzar has built a golden image. And he's so proud of this golden image that he says, you know what, we're going to make a dedication day. And everybody and all the kingdom, we're going to call all of them to come. And we're going to play music. And when that music plays, everybody's going to bow down and worship this gold off. So Nebuchadnezzar gets the party planned. He gets everything together. The day comes. And he they read out the decree. When you hear the sound of the flute and the harp and the lyre and the psaltery, then you bow down and worship the gold idol. And everybody complies. Jew, Gentile, royal, peasant, everybody but three men. Three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, part of the royal court of King Nebuchadnezzar. Everybody bows to this but these three. And you know it to be as true as well as I do. When you do something that your enemy don't like, they're going to go town. You're a teacher, Holly. When you got two kids that don't like each other, when one that the one don't like does something wrong, Miss Jackson, guess what Timmy did? Because we want to get them in trouble. But these, it says in the Bible that certain Chaldeans went to the king and said, you've got some resistors in the camp. See, it's not real hard to point out who's resisting when you're the only three standing in the midst of a battle. It's not hard to figure out who's resisting when everybody else is bowing, and everybody else is giving in, and everybody else is compromising. Hello? It's not, it's not hard to figure out who's the resistor when you're the only three standing and everybody else has acquiesced. So we pick up that story 
All that has happened. And King Nebuchadnezzar has them brought before him. And in verse 13, that then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do ye not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, and this is where it gets good, and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and form of his vision was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Now I want to reread one verse because this is where this came from. Verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times that's where the question comes in. What do you do when the heat turns up? How do you live when the heat gets knocked up a couple of notches? It's no secret in our society that there are numerous ultimatums that are being thrown at us because of our faith on a daily basis. It is no secret you watch the news, work in a secular work environment, work anywhere you want to that's in a worldly setting and you will see that there are ultimatums being thrown at us from society on a daily basis because of what we believe. Amen. If you don't believe it, just look at what our government's doing. And I preached a sermon on it a few months ago. Go back and look at it because I told you the next thing coming on the church was persecution. And it's coming. It's here. It just hadn't hit yet, but you better get ready. But there are ultimatums every day. And in this situation, we see that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have been given an ultimatum. You bow or you burn. That's the only two decisions you've got. But see, these men were so set in their decision. They were so convicted and so convinced that what they believed and the God they served was able that these ultimatums that Nebuchadnezzar threw at them while they were, while it was difficult to make the decision, they were nothing new and it was nothing they weren't prepared for because they understood when what they believed went against his society, they were controversial. They would be picked out. And these ultimatums that Nebuchadnezzar gave these men, it went from the very beginning that they came in because his whole desire was to make them fit his ideology. That's important. Catch on to that. The entire reason that he brought these men in here and the reason why he chose men who were wise and good looking that were Jews to be part of his royal court is because he wanted to change them to fit what he wanted them to look like, to, for them to act like he wanted them to act, to believe the way he wanted to believe so that that way they could influence others to do the same. I told y'all the more you ain't been here, the quicker this thing will go. From the very beginning, Nebuchadnezzar was forcing ultimatums on these men. There's three things in particular you can see that he tried to change about them. First thing he wanted to change about them was their personality. When they came into Babylon, they had Hebrew names. 
We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but that was not their original names. Their original names were Hananiah, which means God is gracious. Mishael, which means who is like God, basically saying there's nobody like him. And Azariah, God has heard. And in that time, the name actually defined your personality. Jacob was named Jacob because it meant trickster. And he was a trickster. Isaac meant laughter because his mother laughed when the Lord said she shall have a son. Names back then meant more than just a label. It defined who you were. And so when they came into the land, Nebuchadnezzar changed their names from Hananiah to Shadrach. I am fearful and afraid of God. From Mishael to there's nobody like him to I am despised, contempt, contemptible, and humiliated. From Azariah to Abednego, which means the servant of Nebo or the slave of man. He changed their names in order to change their personality and make them fit the culture of Babylon. Are y'all following me? So he wanted to change their personality. Second thing he wanted to change was their purpose. These men were servants of Yahweh. They were servants of the great I Am. And while Nebuchadnezzar knew that, he wanted them to be so influenced by the culture around them that they changed their purpose from servants of God to servants of the king. He wanted them to change their purpose and just do away with being God's chosen people and being King Nebuchadnezzar's chosen people. Amen. He wanted to change their personality. He wanted to change their purpose. And he wanted to change their posture. He wanted them to bow to his system, to his beliefs, to his ideology. Drake, what's your point here? Can I tell you that there is a Babylonian Nebuchadnezzar spirit loose in the world today that's trying to do the same thing to the church that Nebuchadnezzar tried to do to these three men? There's a system, there's a spirit in this world that wants to change our personality. I'm not talking about what we physically are, whether we're a jokester, whether we're quiet, introverted, extroverted, but our personality of faith. They want to change our personality of faith and make us fit their design. Make us fit what they believe. Make us do away with what we've always believed in and start adapting to what they believe in. There's a spirit in this world, whether you believe it or not, that hates the kind of preaching that goes on in a lot of our churches because it makes them uncomfortable. And they want to change that. You don't believe it, and, and I am not against Christian television. Please do not, uh, please do not think that. But there are certain individuals, and there are certain people that are not even on Christian television who will give you a watered down, diluted gospel of "I'm okay, you're okay, God's good, it's all good," and half their congregation is living in sin and on their way to hell. And the reason they do it is because that's what draws the numbers. Come on. Yeah. If I can make them feel good, I better stop. I better, Lord, you better help me. But that's what the culture wants us to preach. You don't believe it? Other than here, because I know I've said it here. Other than here, when's the last time you've heard somebody preach a hellfire and brimstone message and tell them you better get right or you're going to burn? I've told you before, there's churches that refuse to have a cross in their sanctuary because it offends people. There's churches that will not see there's power in the blood because blood's too gruesome. They're adapting. And the culture wants that, to change our personality. Second thing they want to change about us is they want to change our purpose. They want us to be people of faith, but also mix in with the world. That's right. Hello? Y'all yeah. help me out here this morning. There's a spirit that wants us to change our purpose. Because see, Nebuchadnezzar had these men schooled in the finest schools of Babylon so that he could form them to fit his mindset. And the culture's doing the same thing to us today. You don't believe it? Every news station you watch is trying to get you to take a side. That's right. Amen. 
I don't care if maybe you're a Democrat or Republican, Libertarian, Independent, don't care. You watch one news station, you'll start believing what they believe in because the more you listen to, the more you put in here, the more you will adapt to their form. Colleges are doing the same thing. Christian colleges now, Christian colleges. Whether you know it or not, Harvard used to be a Christian college. It was founded on Christian principles. But there are, there are men and women teaching in our universities today that are taking these students and they are molding their minds to believing all of this non-binary, all this other junk in the world, and they're trying to make our children fit their description because you know if you can get the children, you can change society. Amen. There's a culture. There's a system wanting to change our purpose. But I have come by to tell you that our purpose always has been and it always will be the people of God. Amen. It always has been that way and I'm not going to change just to appease you. That's good preaching, great keep on. Thank you. I sure will. And the last thing, they want to change our posture. Just like Nebuchadnezzar tried to intimidate and force and guilt these men into battle, the culture, the system, the ideology of our day is trying to do the exact same thing to me and you. They don't want us to stand up for righteousness anymore. They don't want us to stand up for God. They don't want us to stand up for holiness because I've told you, it makes them uneasy. Amen. They want us to bow. Bow, acquiesce, give in, give up, just do what we want you to do is the call of the day. They want us to give up on positions like homosexuality and what we believe. They want us to bow down and give up what we believe about traditional marriage. They want us to bow down and give up about gender neutrality and what this one is that one. And I'm going to say something and God help me just uh, I'm going to tell you, if you're confused about what you are, get in the shower and look down. Because God gave you something to prove what you are. And he's tried to 
intimidate them. He's tried to mold them and maybe not given in yet, but he for some reason thinks that this whole situation, this whole fiery furnace thing, which was nothing but a scare tactic, would make them give up. And he tells them, look, if you'll just give in, give up, that attitude of it's better to ask them forgiveness than permission. If you'll just do that, I'm sure your God will forgive you. But just to save face, you bow, I'll let bygones be bygones, and we'll be good. But if you don't, I've got a burden. Now, God help me here. There's a lot of folk that if they had been in that situation, they would have just said, well, you know what, it may not hurt because I sure can ask for forgiveness. And I really wasn't planning on dying today. They would just give up and say, okay, we'll do it. Just to save face. That way we can keep our position. We can be good. As long as everything's good, we'll be all right. There's a lot of people that would have done that, but not these folks. I love how they answered it. Sister Teresa has said that they looked at him and it said, King, we are not careful to answer you. Basically, Donna, what that meant is they were saying, King, we're not slow to give you an answer. Crystal, they were saying, King, we don't have to pray about this. We don't have to fast three days about it. We don't have to have a board meeting. We don't have to have a committee meeting on this. We, we, we don't have to sit there and pray about it. We can answer you right here and right now. Can I tell you there's some things you don't have to pray about? There's some things you ain't got to go get along in your prayer closet and fast 10 days over. Because you know why? You can pray till the cows come home. You can fast till you lose 50 pounds. You can do all of it. And it won't change this book one iota. What is written is written. You can pray. You can fast. Have counsel with me all you want to. But if this book said it's sin, if this book abomination, if this book said don't do it, then you can pray about it all you want to, but it will not change the word which is forever established in glory. Amen. It won't change homosexuality being wrong. It won't change none of this stuff that's going on in this world. It will not change a thing. There's some things you do not have to pray about. But it goes back to what I said earlier. You're not going to know what's written unless you read it. That's not even part of my sermon. That one was fun. But they said, we're not, we're not careful to answer you. We don't have to pray about it. We don't have to think about it. We don't have to meditate on it. Because we can tell you right here, right now, you can do whatever you want to us. You can, you can threaten us with whatever you want to threaten us. We know who our God is. We know what he can do. We know what his, his rules, his laws are. And we will not give up. We will not bow. We don't have to wait and give you an answer. We'll tell you right here, right now. We will not bow. And I will tell you, you're looking at a preacher and you're sitting in a church that will not bow regardless of if they try to make us not tax exempt, regardless of if they try to burn the bills down, regardless if they put me in jail. I will not bow. Yeah. I don't know if I'm mad or annoyed you right now. Y'all better just pray because it's just, if I'm not mad at nobody, I'm mad at the devil. I'm mad that he thinks that he's going to take us down. But the word says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Yeah. But he told him, he said, you can bow or burn. And they said, we can tell you right now. You can threaten us with what you want to threaten us. But we can do that. And the Bible says he got so mad that his expression, his attitude, his demeanor, his visage totally changed against them. He was full of fury and rage. And it said, he said, turn the furnace up seven times higher. Now, you can look at that and tell Nebuchadnezzar had a little bipolar issues. Because that's a little overkill. History will tell you that the furnace that Babylon had after some research, 
even at one level, was hot enough to melt gold, which I forget is 1400, whatever, I forget exactly how much it was. So if it's hot enough to melt gold, it's hot enough to burn Greenland. But he was so mad, Brother Gene, that he said, turn it up. Turn it up. As a way of saying, I want to make sure they die because they defied me. As a way of saying, I'm going to make sure that my wrath has been satisfied. You turn it up and you let make sure that they burn. And the Bible says they snatched them up, clothes and all. Now, this is where we finally get to the sermon. What do you do when the heat is turning up? What do you do when what is already difficult becomes harder? What do you do when a battle that has already been the worst battle you've been through gets to a point that it seems unbearable, Misty? Samantha, how do you live when what you've already felt like you couldn't handle gets knocked up seven notches? What do you do? How do you live? There's four things that these men did in their actions, and I'll be done. First thing you've got to do is be convinced and don't compromise. Be convinced and don't compromise. You see it in their speech. They said, King, we're not kept for answer you in this matter. Our God, whom we serve, he is able. I wish I could stay right there for a second. Our God is able. To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly all you can believe, ask for thing. Our God is able. Our God who is able to heal the blind, make the lame to walk, to make the dead to live. Our God's able. Amen. Wish I could go on that, but I don't have time. Our God is able, and he will deliver us. Do you see the confidence there? Do you see that confidence of our God is able? Our God can, and he will. Amen. Our God is able to deliver us. Our God is able to make a way. Our God is able to make a path in the wilderness. Our God is able to make the dry places flourish. Our God is able to give us a way through the fire. He is not about whether he's able or not because he's always been able and whether he delivers us in the fire or out of the fire, it's up to him how he delivers us. But don't you dare think that even if we die and we burn up, was not able because our God is able. How he does it is up to him, but he's able. Whatever avenue he uses is his decision, but he's able. Don't you dare ever think, King, that our God is not able because he always has been and he always will be. You got to be convinced of that. And when you're convinced of something, you won't compromise. When you're convinced of something, you don't have to make a deal with the devil. You don't have to give and take. See, compromise in and of itself is not bad. We do it all the time in business, in marriage. It's all Compromise is a good thing when you can affect the outcome and it benefits everybody. But compromise does you absolutely no good. If it compromises the integrity of this word, it compromises the integrity of who God is, and if it does not change the outcome, compromise is useless. And these men knew God's word's written. We're not going to bow. We're not going to worship an idol. That's an abomination. And God has us in his hand anyway. So, the king, do what you want to with us. Because we're convinced that our God is able. And we are not in your hand, but in his. you got to be convinced that no matter what you're going through, that your God is able regardless of how hard, how difficult the situation is, you've got to remember your God is able and you're in his hands and not the hands of man. You've got to be convinced and don't compromise. Second thing you've got to do is you've got to stay positive in the predicament. Look at their speech again. It said, our God is able Now, put yourself in their position for a second. Put yourself in front of this king, and this is the way I imagine it. I imagine the king's got this big building with a balcony, and right to his right is this 
humongous gold image, and there's thousands and millions of people that are bowing down, and they're looking up, and they're watching this. And imagine these men and all these other Chaldeans and Babylonians who were spouting things off at the king, trying to persuade him, just kill them, just get rid of them, because we don't like them anyway. We don't want them here. They're, they're controversial. They make a stink. And, and, and hear the king say, you know, I'm go i got to kill you if you don't do what I tell you to do. I'm mad at you. And imagine hearing all this, and imagine the fear that they're feeling, because not only are all these people watching them, but there's, but there's people down there, they, they may have had families, we don't know, and, and, and we, their brothers, their sisters, all these, these relatives that are bowing, they didn't have the, the, the strength that they had, and they're, you can know that they've got fear of saying, what happens if we die? Well, they've got all these emotions and all this negative stuff, and imagine having that coming at you, and then having to make the decision, which voice am I going to believe? Having all these voices, external, internal, feeding, that are all telling you, don't do it. <coughs> Bow, get it over with. You can, you can ask for forgiveness later. Don't just, 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 just give in, give up. Don't you? Don't, don't say nothing. Don't do nothing. Can you imagine? Feel all the negativity, having to make a decision. That one still small voice saying, you know what's right. Mm -hmm. Imagine. And these three men, everything coming against them, and they made the decision. We're not careful to answer you, Daniel. Because our God is able, and he will. They decided, rather than listen to all the negative emotions, all the fear, all the worry, all of the threats, <coughs> three surrounding and feet all on all of that, they chose to reach deep down inside themselves. And remember, before I came here, my name was who was like my God. Before I came here, my name was Azariah, that God answered. Before I came here, my, my, my name meant something. And I, I reached way, way down, and I remember that. And so I know that while all this negativity is coming at me, I'm choosing to feed off what I know God can do and what he is able. And I choose to feed over the good things the holy things, the righteous things, rather than the bad report. Yeah. <laughs> Where's that thing? Hold on one second. I meant to leave this thing out. Some of the most godly things some of you can do and what you're going through is to throw this thing away. Yeah. But I need it. No, you don't. Go get you a cricket flip phone for $50. That's all you need is a phone call. Y'all yeah. ain't going to help me to. That's fine. I'll finish to myself. <laughs> some of the best godly thing y'all could do is to put this little idiot box away, quit scrolling through Facebook, quit looking on Twitter, quit looking on Instagram, quit, quit scrolling through TikTok and baptizing yourself and everybody else's negativity and start thinking on the good things, the holy things, the righteous things, the good report. And the Bible says in Philippians 4, 8, think, think, think on these things. This thing's not helping you one bit. But that's what I read my Bible on. If you need a Bible here, I'll give it to you right now. Because this thing ain't nothing but a distraction. Mm -hmm. I got that out of my seat. That's the most godly thing some of y'all can do. Is put away all the social media. Put away all the other garbage. Because that's all it is, is garbage. And you know the saying, garbage in, garbage out. What you feed is what will grow. You want to be more positive? Get in the book. That's the only way you're going to get your mind fixated on the right things. Because this world has nothing positive to offer. Amen. Yeah. This world has nothing good in and of itself. They chose to stay positive in the predicament. They chose to listen to the voice of the Spirit, to listen to the voice of God, the good things of, you know, it was a win-win situation for them. Whether God delivered them in the fire or out of the fire. If they came out of it, great. God got the glory. Whether they died in it, great. We're going to be with him. It's a win-win situation for me. And they said, you know what? That's what we're going to stand on because we fear God more than man. But you got to stay positive. Keep your thoughts set on the righteous things. The good reports. Sister Gloria, it don't matter what they tell you at the end of this week. You keep your mind 
fixated on the good report. And Brenda, it don't matter what that bank statement says at the end of the month. You fix your thoughts on the holy things, Amen. the righteous things, on what the word says that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Amen. Don't think about what comes at you. You think about greater is he who is in me than he who is in this world. You've got to stay positive in the predicament. Third thing you've got to do you got to stay worshipful in the worst. Yeah. Now, I may get excited here for y'all today. I will tell you, you read that in any translation, the word worship, the word praise, any kind of form, it's not real. It's not there. I'll just go ahead and tell you that. I will tell you, though, that the life that they lived, their decision they made was an expression of worship. The fact that they decided to stand when everybody else was bowing, to me, that's an expression of worship, however you want to look at it. But I'll tell you that I have no written evidence, I have no black and white proof that they worshiped during this time. So how do I know that they did? Because the Bible says that when he threw them in there, that the king looked in there and he said, I thought we threw three in. Oh, I'm about ready to go. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we did, King. He said, then who is the fourth man who's walking around in the fire, who his form is as the Son of God? Can I tell you the reason I know that they worship is because the fourth man showed up in the fire. I can tell you that they had a worshipful attitude because the Son of God showed up with them in the fire. And the Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. It don't matter where it's at. If it's in your backyard, if it's in your car, if it's in the midst of the fire, if you'll worship him, he said, where there's worship, I will be there. I can tell you they worship because the poor man came into the fire. Somebody give God some praise. Most of us, Papa, would read that and say, well, there's where they hang out. Most of us, Tina, would read that and say, well, I guess we see fear right there. No, wasn't fear, wasn't doubt, wasn't unbelief. It was resolve. It was resolve. It was resolve that said, our God is able and he will. But if not, See, everything you go through, you always have to wrestle with the but if not. And that's where the world judges that. You see. That pause in between the problem and the answer, that middle ground, that but if not, that's where the world starts watching what we're going to do. That's where they start seeing, because they know, and you know, we're going to shout if we ain't got to go in the fire. Yeah. 
We're going to shout at the king said, you know what? I'm sorry. Don't disperse what you do. You go on home. Don't forget all that. We'll shout if we ain't got to go through it. We'll shout as long as the doctor said we made a mistake. Don't worry, there's no problem. We'll shout if everything goes the way we want it to, but what do you do when your buddy's dying? Yeah. Misty, I'm on this side of your room. How do you wrestle now, Holly? That buddy is gone. You lay out all your expectations, lay out all your plans, but there's that thing of but you're gone. What do you do? You have exactly what Misty did. You have to fall back in faith on God. You have to fall back in who you are and who he says you are in him. And say, you know what, King? We know God's able. And we really believe he will. But if not, we're still not going to bow. We're still not going to give up. We're still not going to give in. Because you know what? Our relationship, our commitment to follow and live for God is not based on what he's pouring out on us. Hello? Our commitment, our relationship to God is not based on the blessings he's pouring out on us, but it's based on who he is. It's not what he does, what he can do. It's who he is. Our commitment to him is based on the integrity of his character. On not what's in his hand ever to pour out on us, but what's in his heart towards us. They knew they were chosen people. They knew they were set aside for a purpose. And they were called that. And they said, King, it don't matter. We know he's able, and we know he will. But if not, you can do what you want to, and we will not bow. And you know the story. How he threw him in there. They refused to give up. In the end, the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar and the whole, the whole kingdom, they were astonished and astounded because of the work that God did, because of what God delivered them from. What do you do when the kings turn up? You got to remain at rest in your resolve. God does it the way you want to, great. But if not, is your relationship with him based off of his blessing or is it based on who he is? They said, King, it don't matter what you want to do. We will not bow because we love him and he loves us. If we die today, fine. But if not, we will never compromise our faith. <clears throat> there are situations in life that the entire purpose of them from the enemy is to get us to bow, give up, be done, get afraid. If he uses scare tactics just like him, just like Nebuchadnezzar, he uses fiery furnaces. He may lose your job. You may, you know, we may have to put you on probation. We may have to. You know, we may have to do this. If you, if you don't do that, well, he tries to use all of those things. You know, I, I, and, and even in personal battles, he uses scare tactics. You know what? You could die tomorrow and your kids would have nothing. Or, you know, you can do this. He uses all of this mess. And all some of these trials are is to get you to give up and give in and then just stop. But you know, Something I thought about, and I heard somebody else kind of say this, but never thought about it this way. We don't want to go through a trial, and I'm sure they didn't want to face that fiery furnace, Jess. But when you read the end of the story, Emma, you see that they had to go. They had to go, King. Why? Because God had to prove to Nebuchadnezzar. Because he even said, who is this God? that you're trusting. Who is this God? That arrogance of who do you think he is? I'm the king. They had to go, Linda, because God had to use somebody. Can I tell you
you, and I'm hoping that I'm starting a sermon series next week, and I'm getting way too much into it, but that's fine. You can hear it four more times. What you're going through is not about what you're going through. It's about what you're going to. And I'm going to say it again this way. What you're going through is not about that. It's about God getting glory from you. Because when they came out, Nebuchadnezzar made a declaration and said, you do not touch these men. And don't you dare speak evil of their God. Because he is God. He is real. And God, I love this. God took the place of their execution, did he? And made it the place of their exaltation. He took the place that was supposed to tear them down, get rid of them, make them, make them nothing made the place where God raised them up. Can I tell you, when you stay faithful, when you stay convinced of who your God is and you don't compromise, when you stay positive and keep your mind fixed on what God can and what God will do, when you stay worshipful even in the worst of times, in the best of times, yes, in the worst of times, absolutely, you worship Him. When you stay remaining in your resolve and you say, God, I won't bow, I won't give in, then that which was meant to destroy you will be the place in which God raises you up, in which God makes you a spectacle of His glory, of His goodness, of His grace, of His mercy. It's not about you, but it's all about Him. He will take the place of your execution and make it the place of your exaltation. He'll take what the devil meant for evil and he'll flip it for no good. There's some of you in here. You've been going through battles. You've been facing pressures. There's some of you that you're facing pressure at work. That they're, that they're trying to get you to change your mind. They're, 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 they're bombarding you. They're attacking you because of what you believe, because of who you are as a Christian and what you stand for. <clears throat> and they want you to give in. There's some of you facing family members with the same attitude. You make somebody feel uncomfortable at the family get together because of what you believe. There's some of you that are facing, there's teenagers. Some of them not even here. Teresa, I can only imagine what y'all face in high school now. Destiny, I can only imagine. Because I know what it's like. It wasn't that long ago I was a high school senior. And I know what it's like to be the one that they kind of pick on because, well, they don't come to the parties because they don't drink. They don't come to the parties because, you know, they believe in, that they believe in saving themselves for marriage. I know what that's like. I did. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. And when you don't have, when you don't comply, you're the one. You have to freeze because you're not like them. I'll tell both of y'all something. I'll tell every other teenager, Emma, sitting here, don't y'all dare. Don't you dare. Because I'm going to tell you, listen, Lord, help me. It don't matter how much they pressure you, how much they try to make you give in. At the end of the day, if God be for you, who can be against you? If you are the only one sitting at the lunch table, that's fine. Because they can't see them, but the Bible says that the angels be kept round about those that fear you. Know. Don't you worry about them. God will take care of them. Don't you worry about those. God will handle them. You just stay faithful. Don't you dare bow. Don't you dare give in to the pressures. Because one day, it'll be worth it. It'll be worth saving yourself. You won't have to worry about having a DUI at 17. Hello? You don't have to be worried about having to go get a, an STD test because you, you've been fooling around like some of these others. You don't have to worry about all this because you've saved yourself and you've set yourself apart from God. Don't you dare give in. And I'm going to tell all you adults the same thing. You may not be facing what they're facing, but you're facing something. Some of you are facing battles that are so strenuous, so hard, so difficult, that if you were to stand up in front of this church and tell us, we would be amazed.
amazed at what you've been going through. But I come by to tell you today, don't matter how much the pressure is applied, don't matter how hard it gets, don't matter what kind of scare tactic the devil is using, you stand firm and you stay faithful and you just trust in your God and in the end, he will give you double of what the enemy tried to take away. I want everybody to stand. If there's anybody here, now we've already prayed for a few, so but even if it's still you, come on. If there's anybody here and you say, Brother Drake, the pressure's being applied. I feel like I can't take any more. I've been going through the fire. I've been going through, and, I, and I, I, I'm just about to burn up. If that's you, and you just, you've got to have some strength. You've got to be reminded and have your faith built. If that's you, I want you to come to these altars real quick and let us pray with you. If that's you, come on real quick. We won't tear you off. If that's you. Jesus' name we pray. Amen.